And uh, I just want to say welcome to everyone to my Somatic Movement and Anatomy Series 2021. And today is class three of the lower extremities. And um, we're going to fill in some gaps at, with, with uh, a, a few moves that I absolutely love and are part of my, mostly are part of my daily cat uh, routine that I do. And um, next month in July, today is Saturday, June 5th, next uh, month in July, um, I'm going to do an integration class for upper and lower extremities, full body. I'm gonna do a lot of full body integrative moves, which are really important to know so that you can toggle back and forth between moves in more local joints or just a region and then integrate all of that back into the full body. So that's my intention. And we'll see how far we get. Anything left over, I'll move over to July. And uh, last month, I thought we would get to standing and walking. We will definitely do a little walking at the end, but I might save that for the integration class. It just depends how timing goes today. Um, I love the anatomy. Hopefully, learning some of the anatomy will really increase your awareness and your ability to understand how and why you're moving. And so some of our movement today will be flows, slow flows, medium flows, and some will be pendiculation where we contract a specific group of muscles, slowly go into the contraction, and then the most important part, slowly decontract out of that contraction to our new neutral, to our new resting length. And so uh, somatic movement um, uh, not only increases awareness, and increases all the positive functions of movement, um, but it really um, allows you, allow, the somatic movement incorporates brain to muscle uh, techniques and it increases that kind of communication. So the nervous system, brain, spinal cord, all the nerves can more fully communicate between brain and muscles and ligaments and tendons and bony joints and all of those things. Remember our somatic guidelines, no forcing. That's the most important part. We go slower. We move in comfort as much as possible. It's a skill to understand what comfort is and it increases, you increase your awareness of keeping movement comfortable as you practice. Back away from pain and follow any medical directives that you have been given. We're going to start in a chair, a regular chair with our feet on the floor, because we're going to be looking at pictures and doing some self palpation and some movement in the chair. And I'll be going back and forth between slides, stopping the slides, showing you some of the palpation. And then after the slides and some chair movement, then we'll go on to the floor. So you want your floor mat and some pillows for support. And then we'll end with some walking. And hopefully, you'll really feel a difference in your walking. OK, um, I'm going to go ahead into screen share now. And let me minimize that. And how does that look, Isaiah? Does it look pretty good? Okay, so we've had this slide before. It's just showing that today is class three of the lower limb. And we've seen uh, most of these pictures before. I changed the slide a little bit. I really want to emphasize that the whole body, the soma, the soma, our living internal experience, body, mind, spirit, uh, works synergistically. People will have a pain here, a pain there, and they go, oh, well, my hip hurts. The pain must be from my hip. The body works synergistically all together uh, where the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And your pain and problem may be right near, I mean, your, the source of your problem may, may be near where the pain is, but it may be quite far away from it. And so we're, we're going to, hopefully we, hopefully we discover that. And then uh, the main concept around working with extremities or limbs, our limbs, also called our extremities, 
which are our arms and legs, need the support and control of the spine and trunk to move with ease and efficiency. And I wanna redefine trunk. So the trunk is basically this rectangle. It includes the shoulder and the hip joints. It includes the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, the sacrum and the coccyx or tailbone. The neck is also part of the spine and very important. It's usually not considered part of the trunk per se. The rib cage, three-dimensionally, our rib cage, front and back. And then our somatic center, very important, the somatic center. Here's the somatic center in the back between the bottom of the ribs and the top of the pelvis. These are your iliac crests. In the back, the somatic center has a smaller space. And in the front, where the rib cage comes up and the pelvic bones come down into the pubic bones, this is a lot longer space of the somatic center in the front. And then the sides vary. And uh, the reason that the somatic center is so important is all movement um, negotiates with the spine, with spinal movement and with the somatic center. The somatic center needs to negotiate upper to lower body movement. It needs to negotiate side to side movement and it needs to negotiate rotational movement. So it's really important that we get our somatic center moving in comfort. And then the pelvis, here's the pelvis and we're gonna go right into a picture of the pelvis because um, this, we're, our first major focus is going to be uh, of uh, pe the pelvis and a very particular part of the pelvis. But let's just look at this slide for a moment and identify. Here's your sacrum and your coccyx. This is actually part of the spine, but it's embedded within the pelvis. And then we have two ilium bones, two ilium bones. And we have the yellow is, we have two um, ischium bones. The bottom part we refer to that we sit on are sits bones, the ischium bones, especially this bottom part, the ischial tuberosities. Um, we often refer to the, those bones as the sits bones. And then this kind of, it's kind of pink in my screen. We have two pubic bones and a disc. And this is what I, we're gonna pay special attention to today because it's a new concept for most people. A lot of people think we have one pubic bone. We have two pubic bones. And we have a disc in the middle of the pubic bones. And um, the anatomy books will describe the movement between the two pubic bones as barely movable or slightly movable. Not true there is more movement than people realize between the two pubic bones. And just knowing we have two pubic bones that have to move in relationship to each other is astounding for most people. But let's, where you have a disc, you often have a movement. And um, so this disc space right here to this side of your disc where it meets the pubic bone and this is my left over here. Uh, and then over here, this side of the disc to this pubic bone, we have movement. So we have two pubic bone places of movement in relationship to each side of the disc to their bone. And we are going to feel that and move that today a lot. Um, the, the, uh, to the, pubic, uh, the pubic joints, the two pubic joints here and here are not voluntary joints like your shoulder joint is where you can just move it. But when you move your, your this is your hip socket, here's your hip socket. When you move your hips, your legs in the hip sockets, it moves each pubic bone in relationship to the hip. And when you move your spine and your somatic center and your pelvis, these two, uh, pubic bones and their two joints have to accommodate that movement. And it is actually getting more movement and flexibility in these two joints that is going to, in most cases, release the sacroiliac joints. 
So a lot of people have sacroiliac problems. Oh, my sacroiliac hurts where the sacrum, here's your sacrum meets the ilium, sacroiliac joints. This is also a non-voluntary joint. And the key in most cases to this re resolving issues with the sacroiliac joint is resolving and getting movement and flexibility in your pubic joints. I just want to do a shout out to the pelvic floor. It's the sling of muscles in the bowl down here. Let me orient you. Here's the sacrum. Here's the coccyx or tailbone. Here's the tailbone. Here's, the, here's a pubic bone. Here's a pubic bone. Here's the disc pubic bone, pubic bone disc. Here is a, here are the hip sockets here and here. Here's the uh, sits bones, the ischium bones, the sits bones here and here. When you move and you move through your pubic joints, it helps you to move and get movement and get flexibility in the huge sling of the many muscles that make up the pelvic floor and it also helps with freedom in the urogenital organs. Then we're going to go to let's look at this picture. I love this picture. So I like this picture because it's showing the hemipelvis without the sacrum that this is this is a hemipelvis and this is a hemipelvis. Between the two hemipelvises is the sacrum. So they've left it out, which is nice so that you can see. And here's the space for the pubic joint called the pubic symphysis, or this disc is called the pubic symphysis. And so this whole hemipelvis relates to this whole limb. This hemipelvis relates to this limb. Of course, as we move one hemipelvis, it can have a great deal of uh, movement across to the opposite limb. But it's showing you that the, the freedom of the hemipelvis at this pubic joint is going to really do a lot to free up your whole lower limb or extremity, your whole leg, on one side and the other. So let's look, we're gonna do a little palpation. We're gonna start by putting our hands on, our, on, the, on the pelvic uh, crest, on the iliac crest. We're, we are gonna be palpating our pubic bone. We are gonna be palpating our sits bones and the pubic symphysis. Let me come out of screen share so I can guide you. Let me just, oh, let me just point out joints. I did, here are the hip joints the two pubic joints. We also have the two sacroiliac joints. And this, where it meets the lumbar spine, is the um, sacral lumbar, lumbosacral joint. So there are a lot of joints surrounding the, the, um, the pelvis. And uh, we're also going to be palpating some bony landmarks. This is the point in the front called the ASIS, anterior superior iliac spine. We're just going to call it the as is, ASIS. We have one on each side prominent. We're going to palpate those. In the back, we don't have a good picture, but there's the, uh, you come around and on the outside, on the uh, uh, posterior side, you've got some bumps too called the PSIS, posterior, the posterior bump. We're going to palpate, um, as I said, our sits bones and our pubic bone and pubic symphysis. Let me just look at my list. Okay. Let's go to, let me come out of screen share. Okay, I'm, I'm back in. All right, now we're going to do some palpation. I'm gonna move back a little bit and start by just putting your hands, uh, your hands, if you can, if you, do, if you have a bum shoulder or something, just do what you can, but you're on top of your iliac crest here. And if you, um, I'm going to stand up, but you don't have to. I just think it might be easier for people to see me. But from the iliac, I mean, you can stand up if you want, but it's not necessary. You've got these, you want to follow this iliac crest till you come to these 
quite prominent bones. I don't think there's anybody I've never been able to find them, although one can be more forward and one can be more recessed because of imbalances in the posture. So here's your ASISs. Those are really going to be important today. And you may be able to find your PSISs. Sometimes they're very prominent on people and sometimes they're not. It doesn't really matter. And then back here is your sacrum, your coccyx below your sacrum. Okay, here's the meat of the bum. Okay, now we're gonna find our pubic bone. You can do this in sitting. Start with your fingers at your navel. Is there enough light on me, Isaiah? Is it okay? Um, and uh, you're going to just walk your hands down to your pubic bone. Remember, the penis is lower, so you're not going to run into that. Maybe if I come here. Actually, that's better light, isn't it? OK, so I come down my navel, and I run into my pubic bone. You definitely want to find your pubic bone. And spread your legs a little so you have a little more room. I would say take off your shoes. I, I'm, I'm in my socks right now. because. Uh, just it's nice to let the feet roll and you've got three rims all right I, sh I should have pointed this out let me go back to let me go back to screen share for a moment uh-oh what happened are we there yeah. okay so there's a rim at the top that's facing your chin there's a rim facing forward and there's a rim underneath the pubic bone, bones. Okay, so we're gonna palpate those now. Okay, I'm back. All right, so what you're gonna do is we're gonna palpate and move. So for the movement, spread your legs a little bit. And what you wanna do is I like to put either my index fingers or my middle fingers right on the center, right now I'm using my middle fingers, right on the center above the disc or on the disc on one side of the rims, maybe the front rims, and my other fingers are spread along the pubic bone. And now start to just move a leg, not too slow, not too fast, but if you go too slow, it'll be harder to feel the movement. And then you're gonna switch legs and you're gonna go back and forth. And as you do that, feel the, it doesn't matter your, your, sometimes I do one leg in and out several times, but feel how much movement between the pu two pubic bones at the disc. And you can feel from above on the top rim, you can feel from the front rim, you can feel from the bottom of the rim, this is, key in today's class. If we did nothing else, I want, I'm, I'm hoping that whether you're good at palpating and can feel it, that you start to, even in your imagination, realize incredible amounts of movement. Now, let's, let's do side to side movement. This is that hip hiking move. If I press a leg down and push, it helps me to go onto my opposite sits bone. And so I'm, I'm, bringing the weight onto one sits bone, the other is rising up. See if you can get that alternation. This is a flow movement. And now bring your hands back to your pubic bones. Again, I like to be in the middle, either with my index or middle finger, so I can really feel the joints and then the bones. And you're going to do this hip hiking. And you're going to hopefully feel one bone is going up and one bone is going down. There's a lot of movement. One bone up, the other is down, and then they trade places. You might want to bring your fingers into different parts of the pubic bone, different movements. I'm kind of half on the top rim, half on the front rim, and also, my fingers are spread from the center to the sides. And now let's do rotational move of the pelvis. First, let me make sure you understand how to do this. I'm going to be bringing 
one knee forward and the other knee is back, that brings this hemipelvis forward, this hemipelvis back. I can even put my hands on my as is, is my A-S-I-S. -S, and this is a flow movement. And as I bring one knee forward, my feet are staying planted on the ground so that the, the feet are staying planted and the movement is, it might even be up through my upper trunk and spine, but we're focusing on the pelvis. One hemipelvis is rotating forward like in walking. This would be the forward leg, the backward uh, ASIS, the backward hemipelvis, that would be the backward leg. And so here we have uh, our legs going forward and backward, the pelvis is rotating. Legs are going forward and backward. The hemipelvis to each hemipelvis to accommodate that is rotating. And so again, I'm going to spread my legs a little, even though it's a little bit not in the walking position. And again, I want to palpate and feel how much movement. And now I have one pubic bone is more forward one is more backward. So each of the three planes of movement in the sagittal plane with like an arch and curl, in fact, go ahead and touch. Now with an arch and a flatten or an arch and curl, your two pubic bones are moving together. This movement is being generated, for example, by lower back muscles and belly. The two pubic bones are in relationship to each other, but you can feel both pubic bones coming more up and down in the sagittal plane, this, this plane, the up-down plane. When I'm doing the hip hiking, I'm working with the coronal plane or the frontal plane that divides my body. So I have a front half of my body and a back half of my body. And then when I am doing the forward back with my leg and my pelvis is rotating, I'm working with the horizontal plane. I'm working with the horizontal plane that divides my body into an upper and lower body. So we're going to be also doing these movements on the floor with our knees bent. You can do them in any position really, but the idea is to start uh, getting you curious and intriguing you with just the incredible amount of movement in the pubic joints and how crucial it is to the movement of our whole lower extremity. And often when we release our lower extremity, our upper extremity releases more, our jaw releases more, our pelvic floor releases more, all these good things seem to happen all throughout the body. So that, that, helps us to start movement and understanding how much uh, movement there really can be. Uh, let's just um, now go to, uh, let me just see if I have anything left before we go to the floor. Oh, actually, I want to show a few more slides. So let me go back to screen share. I'm, can you close that door? Thank you, Isaiah. Um, and um, okay, screen share, share, okay. All right, it always takes more time than I think it's gonna take. We are going to be doing a wonderful move. We did it in our convention that Bill Keel introduced working with the lumbar spine and deep, this is the multifidus deep under the erector spinae muscles. A lot of people know about the erector spinae muscles but multifida muscles are deep and are stabilizing muscles. I, excuse me, I, uh, oh, maybe it stopped. <laughs> Sorry, a phone went off in another room. It's not my phone. Okay, and so we're going to be uh, working with these deep stabilizing muscles. Deep, deep muscles are very important because they stabilize joints. The larger superficial muscles like the erector spinae muscles, they do large ranges of motion, but they are not very stabilizing to the joint. It is the deeper muscles that need to be working properly that stabilize joints and help with joint position. And just to remember the nerves come out uh, between each vertebrae, nerves come out and that's what feeds our muscles. 
Okay, we're going to be working in a bent position uh, with uh, our foreleg and foot doing medial rotation of the foreleg and foot and lateral rotation of the foreleg and foot. And that is controlled by the hamstring muscles. So here are the hamstrings. Here's your lateral hamstring, biceps femoris. It comes down and around and it attaches to the fibula and, and more structures. And here are your medial hamstrings, comes down and around can, uh, uh, and attaches to the tibia and a few more structures. And it is the medial hamstrings that control medial rotation and the lateral hamstrings that control lateral rotation of the foreleg and foot. And so we often don't think of the hamstrings controlling this knee balance, this knee balance. People are always working with the quad tendon that goes over the knee and there's nothing wrong with doing that, but you're going to find your knees are going to align and balance side to side when you get control of your medial and lateral hamstrings are coming down from the back of the thigh to each side of the knee and uh, getting the control of your medial and lateral rotation of your foreleg and foot. And then the last star of the show is going to be the subtalar joint. A lot of people have never even heard of it, but the subtalar joint is the most important joint for allowing inversion and eversion uh, of the foot. And this joint is often called the steering wheel of the foot. So let me come out for just a moment. All right, put your hands on a fake, on a pretend car steering wheel. And you, you're able to turn the steering wheel from side to side. Well, that's what we're going to be doing with each foot should be able to turn. We're, you, you can just look at this and then we'll do it when we're lying down. But each foot needs to turn with the steering, like a steering wheel. The foot needs to be able to turn. The foot needs to be able to turn. And so I'm going to go back into screen share. And that is happening at a number of bones, but it's especially happening at the subtalar joint. So let me orient you. Here's the calcaneus or the heel. Here's the big heel bone. Look how far out it's supposed to stick. <laughs> and this is the Achilles tendon. And on the inside of the ankle, you have the tibia bone coming down. On the outside of the ankle, you have the fibula bone coming down. The fibula comes lower than the tibia. You can just look down at your feet and see that, but let's, let's actually go on. And now here is the talus bone. People don't even know the bones of their feet, but this is an important, very important bone. This is your talus bone. And this is your subtalar joint between the talus and the calcaneus and uh, the, uh, in this case, the lateral ankle bone, which is the fibula. And here's your subtalar joint on the inside of the foot. And it joins the calcaneus and is joins the uh, under the tibia. And of course, the talus also, this is the navicular bone, has other joints that play somewhat of a role, but it's this right here. Think of it three-dimensionally. And right here, this is the subtalar joint. And this is what allows and gets very stuck, allows your foot to invert or roll inward where the inside, where the bottom of the foot rolls inside this would be, quote, your neutral. And then the bottom of your foot rolls to the outside, eversion, eversion and inversion. And you, it's a very important joint to start to play with and acknowledge. And as we contract muscles that help us to invert and evert, the sensation should be right under the ankle. 
the sensation should be right under the ankle of contraction and release. So we'll be playing with that today. Okay, with that introduction, let's set up on the floor and lie down. And you want support uh, as you need it. You want support for your head. Um, a lot of people need that so that they their neck stays parallel or even a little bit longer. What you don't want when you lie down on the floor, if your chin is sticking up, then you're shortening the back of your neck, bad habit. So support is much better to use if that's your posture when you lie down without support. Okay, so um, you take a little time to just let yourself become present and, um, and I'm trying to find where I am in my notes. Okay, here I am. Um, so you wanna orient yourself just to resting on the floor, feeling the support of the floor. And when you find your position of support, whether your legs are long or your knees are supported by a bolster or your legs are bent, let your arms be comfortable, whether they're down on the floor or your hands are on your midriff, on your belly somewhere, whatever position of comfort you've chosen and you're welcome to keep looking for your position of comfort. Every once in a while, we're in a position that we need to shift. The important part is not doing, allowing your body to feel the support below you. You may feel it below your head. Lots of parts of your back and buttocks are on the floor. And depending on how your legs are positioned, parts of your legs are either on the floor or supported by a bolster. And uh, if your legs are straighter on a bolster, your heels are in contact. If your legs are bent, your feet, the bottoms of your feet are in contact. And you could spend a lot of time just going through your body and seeing if you are not tensing. Check your jaw. Is your jaw still in some tension? Can you allow your jaw to release that tension? Maybe your hands and fingers are still carrying some tension. Maybe your belly is still carrying some tension. Maybe your feet are, or your toes, or your back, or your shoulders. You're just allowing a not doing, and it takes quite a long time, more time than we're gonna take right now, but it takes quite a long time to go through and, and notice where you are still holding tension. And now we're uh, going to um, begin with, uh, with our movement. All right, so let me find where I am. In my notes, here I am. Okay, so let's start with a, a very similar warm up to what we did when we were palpating our pubic bone. But we're before we get to the palpation of the pubic bone, go ahead and bend your knees, and we're going to warm up in the three planes of movement, the three planes of dimension: sagittal, frontal, and horizontal. Sagittal plane movement will start with our arch and flatten. I think most of you have done it before. Some people may be new. If you know how to do your arch and flatten, please do it at a very comfortable pace. Allow your head and neck to be free. Allow your jaw to be free. Allow the movement to go through your whole spine so it does move your head and neck. Your shoulder, you may even find your shoulders move a little bit. It doesn't matter. You're not preventing movement. You're just more focused on your somatic center and your pelvis. Um, moving so that you're rolling towards your tailbone and your low back is gently lifting a little bit away from the floor. 
And then as you exhale, you begin to transition and release the contraction from the back, from the posterior and transition to a little bit of, of a belly or anterior contraction so that you now your pelvis can roll more in a flatten where your pubic bone is coming more towards your chest. And you're going back and forth. It's a great warm up. It's our cat number one. It's the first movement we usually do all the time, no matter what we're doing. And then come to rest. And now we're going to alternate slowly and pendicularly hip hiking with our knees bent, starting with our knees bent since they're already bent. And you're going to allow your hip or one side of your uh, pelvis, hemi pelvis, to come up towards your armpit. Your armpit may come down a little bit. Your head may roll to that side. That one side shortens, the side with the hip hiking shortens your rib squeeze a little bit, and then you slowly come out of that to your neutral. And then you hip hike to the other side. Your buttocks are staying flat on the floor. You're staying within your comfort zone. You're backing away from pain. It's okay for the two sides to feel different. So this is movement in the coronal or frontal plane, side to side movement. And now we're gonna go into some rotational movement. Very gently, let your knees, both knees at the same time, let your knees go to the right a little bit. Don't make it too big. And then back to center and then to the left. You'll find your own pace, but what you want to notice as you rotate, so your legs, your knees are going back and forth. What's happening in your pelvis? Your pelvis is rotating. So if your knees are going to the right, your right hemipelvis is more weighted. Your left hemipelvis lightens or rises up a little bit and you're rotating your pelvis. Like if you're going to the right, it's a right rotation. And then you can come back to neutral and you can then bring both knees to the left. Now you're weighting the left hemipelvis. Your, uh, the right hemipelvis is rising up a little bit and your pelvis is rotating to the left. So as you gently go back and forth, notice the rotation in the pelvis. There are different ways to rotate. We're just rotate the pelvis. We're doing the rotation now through the legs in kind of our twist format. and bring that to a close. Okay, let's come back and move and palpate our pubic bone and combine what we did in a chair on the floor with pubic bone palpation and movement. So I'm gonna suggest you separate your feet and legs a little wider so you have more room and you take your fingers and you start at your navel and you climb down your lower belly to your pubic bone. You wanna let your fingers meet in the middle so they're right over the pubic joint and the other fingers are spread along one. Uh, my, my fingers are sort of half on the top rim and half on the front rim. And now we're going to go back to that rotational move with our knees where one knee can go in and out. Now we're in a flow. We're not in a pendiculation. You need a little bit more uh, movement and let that knee go in and out and feel how much movement is happening at the pubic joints. You can alternate with the other knee going in and out. And you can go back and forth. You can let one knee go a little ahead of the other knee. And then like you can bring your right knee to the right a little bit, let your left knee come a little bit to the right, then come out with your left knee to the left, go in a little bit with the right. The idea is you're moving to feel the palpation you're doing to feel just how much joint movement there really is and can be at your pubic joints. And you may find one of your pubic joints is much more mobile than the other one. 
And so you're using your palpation, you're using your imagination, you're using a sense of, oh, these joints, there is the ability of these joints to be free. And bring that to a close. Now, you can leave your knee, you, you, you want to be able to palpate and move, so you can adjust where your feet and knees are. And we're going to go to um, the hip hiking move that we were doing a little earlier, where your buttock stays on the floor, and you're going to alternate. This is more back to a flow, because it's a little easier to feel the movement if you create a flow and an alternation from hip hiking from side to side. So one hip side of your pelvis rises up towards the same ar armpit of the same side, your head may roll a little bit, your ribs squeeze a little bit, and then you go through your neutral and you hike the other hip, you're doing a lateral flexion, there's a curvature in your spine, and see if you can perceive where you're palpating the pubic bones, that one pubic bone is going upward towards your head and one is going footward towards your feet. As you hip hike, let's say on your right side, your right pubic bone comes upward, it elevates your left pubic bone is downward or footward. And then as you hip hike with the left side, the left pubic bone comes up and the right goes down. See if you can, some movements might be easier for you to perceive that movement, but this is your homework, is to start incorporating gentle flows in different directions to start feeling the pubic bone movement and to allow release in the two pubic joints and come to rest. And now we're going to do the kind of rotation that happens in walking. So instead of both knees going at the same time, we're not going to do that version. We're going to do what I call the long back version. So let me describe that. If you want to rest your hands and bring them down, let me go through the movement first, and then we can put our hands back on our pubic bones. This is the one where your feet, your knees are bent, your feet are on the floor, your, feet, your knees are toward the ceiling and you want to keep your feet planted. Now, inhale to exhale, and as you begin to exhale and flatten, let your right knee go forward and your left knee go backward a little bit. Your feet stay planted. And then you're just gonna alternate and now let your, and just breathe and let your left knee go forward, your right knee goes backward. So the forward knee is carrying your right hand, your, the hemipelvis you're going forward on forward, the knee that's going backward is carrying the hemipelvis backward. And this is the walking. You're gonna do it as a flow. And uh, the, the pelvis is, is rotating. One side is getting lighter. One side is a little bit heavier. And you bring your hands back to your pubic bones and see if you can feel the knee that is going forward, that pubic bone is going forward and your other pubic bone is going backward. And then as you reverse, the other knee goes forward. Now that pubic bone is going forward and the backward knee hemipelvis pubic joint is going backward. And so your knees are alternating straight forward and back, but your pelvis is rotating. So as your pelvis rotates, the forward leg, that side of the pelvis lightens and lifts a little bit. The other hemipelvis, the backward hemipelvis is more on the floor. <clears throat> We've done this movement before and sometimes it takes a, a long time to, or a longer time to get the gist of it. But um, for those of you that right away get the gist of this movement, one feet stay planted, one knee forward, one knee backward. It's bringing the hemi pelvises forward and backward. See if you can feel that in the pubic joints and rest. And if you want to rest your arms, your legs, your legs can rest in any position that's comfortable. Take a little bit of an interlude. We are going to prepare ourselves to turn onto our sides, but don't turn yet. 
Um, before we turn on to our sides, if it's comfortable for you to bring a, one of your hands or even both of your hands to your low back, I usually in lying down, I usually do one at a time when I'm sitting, I can do both, but some people have shoulder problems and it's not easy to do. But if you can palpate your lumbar spine, one side at a time. It's probably easier with your knees bent, but it's you can do it either with your legs straight or bent, and it might be a little different with your knees bent or straight. Take one of your hands and if you can, go back into your lower back lumbar spine and feel the spine itself. You'll feel the bumps of the spinous processes sticking out. And then bring your fingers from the spine about two inches to the side and feel the hump of muscle you have to go over. You're feeling a lot of erector spinae, but it's the deeper multifidus muscles and rotatories and the very deep muscles. We're gonna imagine deeper muscles underneath the more superficial spinal muscles. And you want to, why don't you trade your hand so one hand doesn't get so tired if you can. Sometimes only one hand can go back there. You might need to roll a little to one side to get your hand into your lower back area. And you are, uh, start at the spine and then go about two inches away from the spine laterally. And what, what you really want to start feeling is right down at the bottom of the lumbar spine where it meets the sacrum, lumbar four, five. And if you palpate back and forth, I mean, you can, it's great to palpate lumbar one, two, three, four, five, but we're going to most pay attention to the low, low back at lumbar, lumbar four, five. Your waist, if you have a textbook lumbar spine, your waist comes between lumbar four and five. Lumbar five attaches to the sacrum. And that low, low back area is right now the most important part to palpate. But if you can palpate the whole lumbar spine, that's great, spinal muscles. But you wanna determine if you can, which side is tighter. Is one side tauter, stiffer, a bigger bulge? That's your more contracted side. If you can determine that, you don't have to, but if you can determine that, then go ahead and turn onto your side so that your tighter side, your more bulgy side is facing up toward the ceiling. And put a pillow under your head and let your knees be bent. in our regular chair position with our ankles under our knees. And now here's the position we're going to be working from and what we're going to be doing. You're going to take your top leg. Your first movement is just to get the position of the top leg. Your top leg is going to straighten straight down and is going to be parallel with the floor as if you were standing on that leg. If you were standing up straight and on that leg, you want to see if you can determine that leg, where that leg position would be, and then go ahead and rest that leg again. Just bend it and rest that leg. Every time we start this movement, we're going to come into what I call the standing leg position, where your top leg will be straight out, parallel with the floor. So it's above the floor, what, six to eight inches? It depends how tall you are. And you're going to work from there. Okay, now. Start with your leg rested so you don't get too tired. Bring your top hand, if you can, to palpate your lumbar spinal muscles between your spine and about two inches lateral. You can be up higher at L1 or L2 or L3, or you could be lower at L4, 5. Start where it's comfortable for your hand and fingers. And now straighten your top leg in the standing position parallel with the floor and slowly bring your leg a, gently backward. You're not going for big swinging movements. You wanna gently and slowly bring your leg backward, feel those lumbar muscles contract more. And now slowly bring your straight leg forward, not a big swinging move, slowly it, straight leg 
and feel those muscles decontract and go ahead and rest your leg again. So what we're going to spend just a little time doing, your hand, if it can reach, will be palpating your lumbar uh, spinal muscles. And you can be low at lumbar four five. You can do multiple movements and climb up or climb down of the, spine, of the lumbar uh, sp spinal muscles. But what you wanna do, it's not big movements. We're doing the deeper stabilizing muscles that make smaller movements, but stabilize the spine, stabilize and secure the joints so they don't overmove. So the bigger muscles can then do larger movements when it's called for. So we're gonna be doing smaller movements with our straight leg backward and forward. You get to judge, you can modulate, but you're thinking deep spinal muscles so that you reorganize. So your brain reorganizes those deep muscles like the multifidus. Okay, come into the straight leg, top leg, straight leg uh, in standing position. Palpate if you can. As you slowly bring your leg backward, feel those spinal muscles contract, or if they do contract, and then slowly start to bring your leg forward and straight leg and notice those muscles decontracting. And then you can move your hand a little bit and then bring your leg backward. Anytime you need to rest, you're on your side, you're on your, the greater trochanter of your bottom leg. Anytime you need to rest, you rest, rest your arm and then bring your hand back into um, lumbar muscles. Maybe you can reach a little higher depending if you started at L4, L5. If you started at L1, you'd be going down the spine. But at some point you wanna definitely palpate low at L4, 5. That is the area of the most congestion in most people. And th the nerves that come out, it's not just the sciatic nerve, lots of nerves come out and go down to the lower extremity. This is a great movement to release those muscles. Gently back, feel the contraction, or if you're not generating a contraction, because then you have to learn to turn on those muscles, and then forward to feel the decontraction. And bring that movement to a close. I would love to spend more time on this movement, but what I wanna do is have you compare with the other side at this point. So you're gonna turn over onto your other side, take your time, position yourself comfortably. Starting in a comfortable position, head comfortable. You're on the greater trochanter, that big bony bump um, facing the floor. You're stabilizing your pelvis more or less. And now you're going to go into, your top leg is gonna straighten and come uh, parallel with the floor. You're gonna palpate wherever you're starting in the lumbar spine and you're gonna slowly bring that leg Top leg backward, you're extending from the hip and, and, and feel those uh, spinal muscles contract. And then slowly bring your leg forward and feel those spinal muscles decontract. You can rest anytime you want to rest. And then you would reposition your leg long and find a new place to palpate if you can reach. If, you, if your hand is not comfortable on your low back, just let your hand relax and go totally from your internal sensation and your imagination. And you are focusing on deep spinal muscles, deep, deep spinal muscles right close into the spine. These are your, um, these are taking care of the integrity of your joints. You need these smaller, muscles like the multifidi to stabilize the joints so that 
you don't over move, but also so that your larger muscles like the erector spinae can actually do the, the larger, more gross movements. Exercise programs are geared towards the large superficial muscles. Very few exercise programs really deal with the smaller one joint in the spine, a couple of joints, deep internal muscles that are so important for joint health. And in your joint, itself in the spinal joints, as well as in your hip joints and all joints, we have joint sensors for the position of that joint. You want those joint sensors to be able to sense where that joint is in space, to position the joint carefully and correctly and efficiently. So as you use your deep, more stabilizing muscles, and your larger, more gross motor range of motion muscles that the whole system is working synergistically together. And complete the move you're in the midst of and turn over onto your back. This movement is part of my daily routine, maybe not every day, but a lot because it puts me back in touch with my lower back muscles where I can pendicularly contract and decontract them because those lower back muscles are the number one problem area in people, probably in any industrial part of the world. And let's integrate with an arching curl. So gently bend your knees, hands behind your head if you can. And you're going to go ahead and slowly and gently inhale and arch. If you can, your head and your elbows go back. So you do a full spinal extension as your tailbone goes down toward the floor. Exhale, slowly come out, then find an ex. Continue your exhale to curl. Your hands help lift your head. Your elbows come closer together and your pubic bone travels towards your rib cage. Please continue. I have to go moderate something. And Without rushing, complete the one you're in the midst of and rest. Okay, we are going to go to our four legs and feet. So you wanna bend each leg Bend, bend your legs, feet on the floor. This is working with the hamstrings. And it is not only working with the hamstrings, but this is probably the most effective movement to do to get better knee balance. Much more effective than working with the quads to get knee balance, but the two work together, quads and hamstrings, I would do both, but this move, is great for knee balance. So you choose which leg you wanna start with and you position your legs and feet where they're comfortable. Your, your, your working foot is, stays on the floor as much as possible. And your knee stays as much as possible facing the ceiling because you're turning your foreleg under your knee. And you're gonna take your working leg, your working foreleg, and you're gonna Turn it inward and slide your foot inward so your toes go inward, your heels going outward. And then you're slowly gonna come back to neutral. So we're doing this pendicularly. And then you're gonna repeat that. You're going to internally rotate your foreleg and foot together, toes inward, foot on the floor as much as possible. Slowly release. You're using your medial hamstrings. And then one more time, you may even be able to 
internally feel that you're using your medial hamstrings. Maybe you can feel that, maybe you can't. Now take that same leg and let's do external or outward rotation, foot on the floor. And now you're, and this is usually the smaller move, maybe not for everybody, but it usually is. And you're gonna turn your foreleg and flat foot outward, toes outward, heels inward, and slowly back to center. And your knees may move a little bit, but basically your knees are staying centered toward the ceiling and you are focused on turning your foreleg under your knee and your foot and come back to center. External rotation and continue is being done by the lateral hamstrings. Maybe you can feel them as you, um, lateral hamstrings as you rotate outward and then relax as you come inward. You can do this movement like you're doing it now. You can do it in bed. You can do it sitting in a chair with your feet on the floor. It's a great move. You just, the only requirement is that your knees bend. And now we're gonna to go to the other four leg and foot and we're gonna repeat starting inward, foot on the floor. You're turning the, your four leg in, your foot in, toes are going in, heels going out. Knee is staying toward the ceiling. Slowly release back to your neutral and repeat. Internally rotating four leg and foot foot stays planted as much as possible. See if you feel those medial hamstrings, slowly release. I actually feel my medial hamstrings more on one side than the other, just different imbalances my own body has. Complete the one you're in the midst of, and then turn your foreleg outward, toes outward, Heel inward, foot stays planted on the floor as much as possible. Slowly rotate back to neutral. And go ahead and repeat external rotation. See if you can keep your knee toward the ceiling on the side that you are rotating so that you are using your foreleg your hamstring muscles, and then some other muscles are helping. Your peroneal muscles on the side of the leg are also helping. Different muscles are helping, but it is the control from the hamstrings coming down and around to each side of the knee that is really controlling this move the most or is the key to this move. Complete the one you're in the midst of and rest. If you want to rest your legs long, you can. If you want to keep them bent, you can. Give yourself a rest. Okay. Let's go ahead and uh, one leg at a time, bend your knees. And we're going to work with what's called dorsiflexion, plantar flexion at the ankle. We're also gonna work with our toes. So let's define some terminology. When you keep your, keep your heels on the floor and bring your toes and the rest of your foot up towards your kneecaps, your heels stay on the floor and that's called dorsiflexion. And then slowly bring your feet down. Now, we're gonna just work with the toes. Leave your whole foot, your heel, and the ball of your foot on the floor and just raise up your toes. That's actually extension of the toes. And slowly let your toes come back down. Now we're gonna combine, I'm gonna call it toes up because all this terminology is confusing. First, leaving the ball of your foot on the floor, toes up, and now raise the rest of your foot with the heels staying on the floor. So you're combining toe extension and dorsiflexion, or what a lot of people just call flexion at the ankle. Now, when you release, keep your toes up, 
release your foot back down to the ball of the foot, keeping the toes up. And then lastly, slowly release the toes. A lot of us have lost control of all or most of our toes. So once again, toes in extension, toes up, ball stays on the floor. Then the ball raises up as well. You're on your heels. You're doing dorsiflexion, flexion of the ankle with your toes up. Now, as you go down slowly, keep your toes up so that your ball of your foot hits, hits the floor. And then once the ball of your foot finally touches the floor, you're going to slowly let your toes relax. This is, can be challenging. Okay. Now that same, I'm, we're, uh, we're working with both feet. Okay. Now we're going to go into plantar flexion. Now be very careful. The, when you raise your heel up, you're working your calf muscles. Do not do a fast move and do not go for a big move until you understand if, if this move is comfortable, because this is the place where a lot of people cramp their feet and their calves. So now the toes and the balls of the foot are going to stay on the floor and you're going to just barely lift your heels a little bit, keeping the balls and the toes of the feet. You're contracting through the calves, slowly bring your heels down. And we're going to add to that movement. This time, what you're going to do, keep the balls and the toes on the floor, lift your heels, and now lift the balls and come more onto the pads of the toes if you can. Now, as you come down, bring down the balls of the foot first, and then slowly bring down the heels and let everything relax. Sometimes it takes a few seconds to let all that contraction go. And it's okay if you're shaking a little bit. Once again, toes and ball of the feet stay on the floor, lift your heels, feel the balls on the floor. Now start to lift the balls of your feet so that you come more onto the toe pads slowly come down first onto the balls of the feet with the heels staying up and then with the heels coming down. One more time. Heels up, balls stay on the floor, balls and toes, then balls of the feet lift onto the toe pads, then back down to the balls of the feet and slowly down to the heels and rest. You can rest your legs in a different position if you want. That Those are, it's, it seems like they should be really easy, but they're not, they're not easy for most of us. Okay, now we're going to do, um, you're going to, uh, you're going to lengthen your working leg. Your other leg can be long or it can be bent, but your working leg is going to be long and we're going to go into that subtalar joint, the subtalar joint where, so your, your leg is long, so you're somewhere on your heel. You're going to, your leg might move a little bit, but you're going to try to inhibit your leg and your knee from moving too much. A little bit is okay. And remember, your foot is going to become a steering wheel. And I'm going to start this as a flow, and then we'll create it pendicularly. Turn the bot, your heel will stay on the floor. Turn the bottom of your foot inward. And then slowly come through neutral and turn the bottom of your foot outward. You may find one direction is really hard. Don't overdo it. And slowly come through neutral. And now, your foot is going inward. And just a couple more times, do this as a slowish flow where you're turning the bottom of your foot. It's a rotational movement, turning the bottom of your foot inward and outward. And let your foot come to rest. All right, now let's do a couple pendicularly and I'm gonna to add toe movement 
turn the bottom of your foot inward and gently point your toes a little bit if you can. Slowly release to neutral. Your foot in neutral, your toes relaxed. Slowly turn the bottom of your foot outward and bring your toes up, extension of the toes and they'll spread. And then slowly release your foot and toes to neutral. We'll do that one more time. Turn the bottom of your foot inward, gently point your toes. That is a, the full expression of an inversion includes the toes. Sometimes we include the toes, sometimes we don't. Slowly release. Make sure you let your foot and toes relax. Slowly turn the bottom of your foot outward. Your toes go up and they extend and they spread. And slowly release and relax. And now change to your opposite leg. Your working leg is long. Your other leg can be long or bent. And we're going to do the inversion, eversion, the turning of the foot with the second leg. Your knee and leg stay relatively quiet. Turn the bottom. Don't worry about the toes yet. Turn the bottom of the foot inward. Slowly go through neutral. Turn the bottom of the foot outward. You're feeling the contraction right under the ankles. Slowly start to turn your foot inward through neutral. Now you're feeling it on the inside of the under the inside ankle underneath the ankle. And then as you slowly release and come through neutral, you're feeling the contraction under the outside ankle and relax. Because of time, we're gonna go into the pendiculation part. So we're gonna to add toes. So turn the bottom of your foot inward and gently point your toes. Pointing the toes is a form of flexion or curling the toes, do it gently. Slowly release to neutral. Undo your toes and foot. Make sure you've un undone that, uh, that contraction if you can. Turn the bottom of your foot outward and extend or bring your toes up and spread them. And slowly release to neutral. Pay attention to releasing your jaw if you've tensed your jaw as you worked your toes and your foot. One more time. Inversion, turn the bottom of the foot inward and point your toes if you can. Slowly release to neutral. Turn the bottom of your foot outward. Lift your toes and spread your toes. That's extension of the toes if you can. And slowly release to neutral. And relax for a moment. We're going into our closing a couple of moves and we are gonna take a little time to walk. So we're going to do an integrative move, long legs with, with an arch and a flatten and with a, a plantar and dorsiflexion, I'll describe it. So legs are long, you're gonna get ready to point your toes, your feet and toes. Inhale, it'll be a smaller arch because your legs are long, inhale. Gently lift your lower back at, at L4, L5 a little bit and point your feet and toes gently. And as you exhale and move into flatten, your back will flatten, your belly will contract a little bit and bring your toes and feet towards your kneecap. You are dorsiflexing and your toes are extending. Inhale, arch, plantar flex at the ankle. Your toes are pointed or in um, flexion, a little bit of flexion, just carefully. Exhale, begin to transition, let go of the muscles you were contracting and now contract belly to flatten your back and bring your toes and feet towards your kneecap dorsiflexion with toes lifted. One more. Inhale and arch, point your feet and toes. Exhale and flatten, 
Bring your feet and toes towards your kneecap. Slowly release and relax. Bend your knees one at a time. And we're gonna end with the twist. So your, your arm, you can use your arms if you want. Your arms can come out. They don't have to be that far away. Do it in a very relaxed way. Your knees are, I'll start you off, then you can go at your own pace. Knees to the right, face to the left. Your, right, your left arm rolls open uh, outward and your right arm rolls inward. And then you transition knees to the left, face to the right. Your right arm rolls outward, your left arm rolls inward. Let this be comfortable, everything in rotation. Your feet are rolling on the floor. So your feet are actually changing their positions as well in and out. Your legs are rotating, your pelvis is rotating, your somatic center and rib cage are rotating your arms and shoulders and shoulder blades are rotating, your head and neck is, are rotating. You want to end to your side of ease, end in your most comfortable direction. If you need to do a little bit of arch and flatten, just to work out any tension in your back, feel free to go back into an arch and flatten. And rest for just a moment. We're gonna go over about two minutes, those of you that can. And you're going to, I wish I could give you a little more time but we need to roll over and come to standing. And we're going to see if the pubic joint work and the working with the lower back with the leg, leg going back and forth and some of the footwork we did has made a difference in our walking. So you wanna come to uprightness. You wanna maybe stand for just a moment and feel your feet and feel your upright length. And then as you, before you begin to walk, maybe touch your pubic bone and your, your pubic joints in the middle. And just to remind yourself and say to yourself, okay, pubic joints, okay, each hemipelvis as I walk, my, my forward leg and that hemipelvis are going to be um, turning our, at the pubic joint and then the other leg will be. And so just let your arms relax now, arms uh, and go into your la-di-da walk and just think about pubic joint free, freedom as your arms are swinging and you're, and you're walking and you're just walking at a comfortable pace. You, you don't have to be over slow, you don't have to be over fast, but feel each hemi pelvis has freedom. Your forward leg, that is the hemi pelvis and pubic joint on that side are going forward. Your backward leg, that hemi pelvis and leg are going backward. And the freedom is not just in your hip joints. It's not just in your spine and your, and your somatic center. It's all of those synergistically and it's also very much at your pubic joints. New joints for most of us freedom in the pubic joints, a right and a left one to go with the right and left hemipelvis. Let that right hemipelvis flow with the forward and backward leg and let your arm swing in a flow and let your body be comfortable and at ease and lighthearted and fun. And that is going to end our class today.